First family, it sounds like a family reunion here today. I'm glad that you're glad to see one another. I'm glad to see your smiling faces in the house of the Lord today. Uh, we appreciate your desire to come and worship our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Uh, I'm so happy to be back from uh, our mission trip to Honduras. I thank you for your prayers. So many of you have asked how the uh, trip went. I think it perhaps was the best mission trip I've ever been on. Uh, you'll hear a story or 10 in the next few weeks from me about that trip, I'm sure. Uh, but uh, anyway, thank you so much for your prayers and the support of being away from you for a while. Uh, after traveling uh, 24 hours from Friday morning to uh, Saturday morning to get home, I'm so glad, Brian, you're preaching today. Thank you, brother. <laughs> I will enjoy sitting back and listening to God's word through you today. Uh, if you're visiting with us, we are glad that you have chosen to come and honor us with your presence today. We hope that uh, you and everyone here will give us a record of your attendance with us. You'll see the number to text uh, where you can text that number and uh, just uh, text in here. That will let us know you're here. Those folks watching at home uh, can add home to their text and that will uh, help us to have a record of your presence here this morning. I heard great things about uh, our access ministry uh, activity yesterday. Thank you so much for those of you that participated in the event, those behind the scenes that helped to make it possible. Uh, our access ministry is one of the reasons uh, I'm so glad to be a part uh, of this church and the work and the ministries that we support here and around the world. Our next mission trip is being planned for Kentucky, the end of March to the 1st of April. If you're interested in participating in that mission trip to Kentucky, you can con contact Joyce Curl 
and be at an information meeting next Sunday afternoon at 2 p.m. Next Sunday afternoon at 2 p.m. for our Kentucky mission trip uh, in March to the 1st of April. Then this Wednesday night, we're excited about the new offerings for adults that we have, several different choices that you can choose from. Uh, you can uh, be a part of the Financial Peace University. That class uh, will be led by uh, Kevin and Wendy Carlton. You can contact them. Call the church office to register. Uh, there is a cost for this class of $50, which is greatly discounted from the full price that it typically, typically would cost a person uh, to take part. Financial Peace University. And then Moms in Prayer, focused on our schools and teachers and children. Uh, praying especially for them. There's a group led by Barbara Hendricks. You can find more information about it and these others from this past week's newsletter that will help to inform you about that, as well as uh, what we believe. I'll be leaving, leading that study on our beliefs as Baptists, looking not just at what we believe, but why we believe it and how it intersects uh, our culture today, various issues that we're dealing with, and we'll make a special effort to take time for questions and to see how these truths impact our everyday lives. We're also hoping to have a focused prayer group praying on the needs of our world, our nation, our communities, and our church, churches and our church. And certainly there's, there are plenty of things to pray about uh, that a, a small group could take an hour doing that, praying specific prayers to a God who hears and answers our prayers uh, individually and collectively. And then uh, if you'd like to be a part of our worship team here on Sunday morning at 11 o'clock, Russ would love to talk to you about that uh, as well as have new choir members joining as they begin their preparation uh, for a special uh, Easter presentation that will be on Palm Sunday. Uh, our worship that day will be uh, led and focused through our music. And so if you'd like to begin rehearsing with them, they will meet this Wednesday night at 7.15. All of these uh, classes, uh, as well as the worship team, will meet from 6 o'clock up to 7.15. And uh, you, again, you can find more information about them uh, in our church newsletter. If you have not yet filled out this church survey from our pastor search committee, you can find one back in the back. And I believe there's some here at this exit, too. Uh, the pastor search committee asks that you have those completed and turned in no later uh, than this Wednesday, no later than this Wednesday. So if you haven't done that yet, pick up a copy and get that done. And uh, please turn that in just as soon as possible. There's been a good response so far. Our committee is encouraged by those of you that have already uh, done that, but we would like to hear from more uh, of the fellowship here. That would be very good for us. And then also, if you are an ordained deacon, we are going to have the ceremony of laying on hands where we individually pray uh, for a person who is being ordained as a deacon. Uh, we're going to be able to do that for Frank Gentry before our deacons meeting this evening at 5.30. We're asking anyone that uh, is ordained and would like to come and pray for Frank uh, to come and be here in the sanctuary at 5.15 sharp. Uh, we'll begin with a little reading of scripture and then give that opportunity for the laying on of hands. And that will be a very special time for Frank and our fellowship of deacons and meaningful for our church as a whole. So please uh, come and, and take part in that, all those of you that are ordained. And even if you just like to come and observe and pray for Frank, pray for the church, you can come and certainly be here in the sanctuary at 515 as we share that time together. Again, it's great to be in the house of the Lord. Molly Brunson is going to come and have her invocation. Pray with me, please. Lord, we come to you today in order to worship and praise your holy name. We're here not just to thank you for what you've done for us, but to truly glorify who you are. Your presence is already in this house of worship. The Holy Spirit already dwells within us. So we ask that you make yourself known through the music, the worship, your scriptures, and the message that will be preached. Open our hearts, our minds, and our ears in order that we may fully receive the grace and mercy you continuously offer us. It's in your son's holy and precious name that we pray. Amen. Come. 
Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Please stand and join with us as we sing together.
about who God is, his holiness, his majesty, his power, our natural response is to bow before him and to worship him. So let's stand together as we sing to the great I am. Corinthians, the ninth chapter, verses seven through eight. It says, Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to bless you abundantly, so that in all things, at all times, 
you may have all that you need so that you will abound in every good work. Let us pray. Gracious Heaven and Father, creator of heaven and earth and the giver of every good gift, we thank you so much for the gifts you've given us. And Father, we are grateful for the opportunity to return a portion of what you've given us to us. Lord, and we would ask that these gifts would now be blessed to the use of your service in the ministry of this church. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. about y'all, but um, I was fighting back the tears a few times as we were praising and worshiping and just realizing the greatness of our God and the opportunity we have to serve Him, to be along for the ride with uh, the Lord God Almighty, and it's a little overwhelming. It really is. John, welcome home. Um, I look forward to hearing the 10 different um, great things that happened during the time that you were gone. Um, and it is good, though, to be back in this, in this pulpit to share and just uh, appreciate the love and support I've gotten from so many folks after last week. Well, today we're going to take a little bit of a turn still in John chapter 3. We'll be reading verses 21 to 36 in just a few moments. But today we're going to tackle some, some issues within the church that, that goes 
that goes way back. And there are issues within our lives as well. And so as we look at some of these things, you might be thinking, well, that, that's really not me. That, that's not something I, I have an issue with. And if it's something you don't have an issue with, praise God. That is fantastic. Keep praying that it saves that way. But I think in honesty, a lot of us would find, oh, that, that might be me. So what we're talking about today to start off with is the danger of pride and jealousy. Now, pride and jealousy are among the deadliest emotional poisons known to humans. Jealousy has caused the end of relationships and the start of wars. It tears apart families, communities, and even churches. Even if someone attempts to keep all of their jealousy inside, eventually it will tear them apart as well. And you see, jealousy tends to be so strong because it itself is fueled by pride. Looking beyond romantic relationships, I believe there are at least four other types, and the first three are very similar, that endanger our Christian walk. Now, these aren't official types that I read from a book or some great psychological research. This is just old Brian's um, observations, okay? So if you want to debate me on that, you're debating just some guy here, okay? That's just being used of God, hopefully. So, um, but here's what I feel. The first one I think that tends tend to hit us a little bit is identity jealousy. Now, this is when we are jealous of how someone is thought of, someone else is thought of, or the status that they may have. Um, if they're thought of as the man or the woman or the church, we may be a little bit jealous. We wish that we were held in such esteem. And one of the dangers this jealousy poses is that um, we may begin to change who we are from the design that God has for us because we're trying to be someone else. The second type, and again, these are kind of closely related, is what I call an attraction jealousy. We're jealous of the fact that people are drawn to someone else or to a different church. Our pride wants people to notice us like they notice the person that's the, the object of our jealousy. And this may cause us again to inappropriately make changes and stop doing what God has called us to do just to gain attention that we, we wish we had. And you know, there have been many, many churches who have made poor decisions because they've abandoned what God has called them to do, to do what church X has done because thinking, well, if everybody else goes there, that's what we've got to do. And that's especially dangerous in the way in which we disciple our children and youth too. Then a big one that again, I'm, I'm sure none of you have ever had, but that does come up sometimes with people is what I call the better life jealousy. The better life, the jealousy that we have when we perceive that someone else's life is so much better than ours. You know, that perfect family, they all look like Abercrombie mom, models and everything else and everything just goes perfect for them all of the time. They don't have the health houses we have. They don't have the financial houses we have. They don't have the family houses we have. Everything goes perfect. The sun always shines. Their grass is always green. Now, no, 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 one, no one around here has ever had that. But sometimes we may be a little bit jealous thinking someone has the perfect life. You know what one of the greatest dangers of that is? It's a lie. No one on this side of eternity has a perfect life. And no matter how great you may think it is, it's not as perfect as you think. We may think also, and this is the other horrible lie that this jealousy can cause with us. We may think that because their life is so much better, God loves them more. Folks, that's a lie straight from the pit of hell. But it's a lie that a, folk, a lot of folks believe. The thing is, we also need to remember with all that, is even if someone has a lot of blessings, life is short. Our time on here compared to eternity, it's nothing. Don't be jealous for what someone else has. Someone else has. And then probably the one that I call the most dangerous one, I think, in the church 
is credit jealousy. Now, this is one that showcases our personal pride more than the others. It's when we become jealous of the credit someone else is receiving, especially when ministry is being done. And again, this may be the most dangerous type in the church because it can rob us of the joy of giving and serving in the way God wants us to give and serve. It can also really make us look kind of foolish. It may make us like, uh, I think it's Ernest T. Bass of the Andy Griffith show that run out, look at me, look at me, I'm Ernest T. Did I get it right, Lloyd? Is that? Okay, all right. You know, we want to be that guy. You know, look what I did, look what I did. And you're like, okay, you did that, fine. And we may not jump up and down and do that, but I think there are a lot of plaques in a lot of churches because people wanted to make sure that they were known. And nothing against that, but I'm saying when we have to have the credit, we're going down a dangerous road. That's why I think Jesus was very clear in Matthew 6, 3, when he said, you know, when you're giving to the poor, when you're doing stuff, don't let the right hand know what the left hand is doing. Do it in secret. Don't worry about getting credit for it. Serve God. Now, again, the first three are listed above. We need to look at that. Now, if someone or a church has a great identity and is reaching a lot of people for Christ and things for people usually seem to go well for them, there is nothing wrong in looking at that, studying it and saying, is there something that I can learn from them? Is God trying to teach me from that? that?" There's nothing wrong with that seeing the Lord's direction to make spiritual led changes. You know, if people run from us or at least turn the other way, then maybe we need to look at a personality mirror and see if we're doing something wrong. Maybe if there's a choice that is a church that has made the choice to, to meet a specific need that they're uniquely designed to meet. And as a result, people are coming to the Lord. That's something that we can learn from. We can look as a church and say, how have we been uniquely created and gifted by God to meet a certain need? And then when we go and start meeting that need and start living out our faith, start making disciples, amazingly, God's blessing. And people are coming to the Lord. Maybe if someone is having fewer difficulties in their life, they're not struggling with a lot of things, maybe sometimes it's because they're making better decisions. And we can look and see if we're doing things that is making our life more difficult than it should be. However, when we become jealous, we tend to make knee-jerk reactions and act in our own power instead of God's. Jealousy causes us to be motivated by emotional pain instead of the leadership of the Holy Spirit. And that is why it's such a deadly poison. And the scripture that we're getting ready to read in just a second this morning, we have a great example of pride and jealousy rising up among dedicated people. But we also have solid instruction by a great man. And don't take my word for it. Jesus said, no greater man has ever been born than John the baptizer. He said that in in Luke 7 and Matthew 11. But then he goes on to say, but you know what? The least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. Which is another thing to realize. We don't need to get jealous with one another. The ground is level at the cross. We are equal in Jesus Christ. And we need to remember that. But he gives us some powerful teaching here. So if you would, turn with me in your Bibles. John chapter 3, verses 22 to 36. After this... Jesus and his disciples went out to the Judean countryside where he spent some time with them and baptized. Now John was baptized, was also baptizing at Aon near Selim because there was plenty of water and the people were constantly coming to be baptized. This was before John was put in prison. An argument developed between some of John's disciples and a certain Jew over the matter of ceremonial washing. They came to John and said to him, Rabbi, that man who was with you on the other side of the Jordan... The one you testified about, well, he is baptizing and everyone is going to him. To this, John replied, a man can receive only what is given him from heaven. You yourselves can testify that I said, I am not the Christ, but am sent ahead of him. The bride belongs to the bridegroom. The friend who attends the bridegroom waits and listens for him and is full of joy when he hears the bridegroom's voice. That joy is mine and is now complete. He must become greater, I must become less. Or as the King James says, 
He must increase, I must decrease. The one who comes from above is above all. The one who's from the earth belongs to the earth and speaks as one from the earth. The one who comes from heaven is above all. He testifies to what he has seen and heard, but no one accepts his testimony. The man who has accepted it has certified that God is truthful. For the one whom God has sent speaks the words of God. For God gives the spirit without limit. The father loves the son and has placed everything in his hands. Whoever believes in the son has eternal life. But whoever rejects the son will not see life for God's wrath remains in him. Lord, thank you for your word, the ability to have it in our hands, to read it, to hear it in our ears. And Lord, the power you give us to live it. Let us do that. Lord, let it come alive during this time. Get this unworthy messenger out of the way and let your message only be seen and heard. And you alone be glorified in your name, I pray. Amen. Well, you know what the antidote to pride and jealousy is? It's perfectly, perfectly displayed in this chapter we read. And that is humility. We find the disciples of John the Baptist dealing with jealousy. These are good guys. They've left everything. They are serving this guy. And, you know, serving John may not have been easy. I don't know if he made them eat the same diet that he did. But he was eating locusts and wild, hunger, wild honey. Tell you about you, honey's okay, but eat it with bugs. That's not my idea of a weight loss plan. But it sure would work for me, I think. You know, to, to serve with John, to go out with John, to, to leave their families, leave their jobs, leave their homes. These were good guys, godly guys. But as often happens, jealousy comes up. It says a certain Jew was disputing with him about ceremonial, wa ceremonial washing. It was probably the thing of saying, now, you know, which is pure, your baptism or, or Jesus' baptism? And we'll find out, John may preach on this next week in, in John chapter 4, verse 2. Actually, it's the disciples that were baptizing in Jesus' name. And I think that's kind of the same thing like Paul said, you know, I only baptized a couple of y'all. So I don't want y'all saying, well, I was baptized by Paul. You know, I can imagine someone in the first century saying, I was baptized by Jesus himself. You know, um, Jesus saying, you know, in my name, but, but regardless... There were a lot of people coming to Jesus and they weren't coming to, to John. And John's disciples like saying, what you going to do? Pretty much, I think, was the way the attitude was anyway. And John was like, okay. That's what my ministry was all about. He told his disciples that he never expected to be more than the one who he was. He was to set the stage for Jesus. He was the forerunner. And in fact, if you remember, guys, I said at the beginning, I'm not worthy to untie this guy's shoes. He's the real deal. He's the Messiah. I never said that I was. John the Baptist is a perfect example of humility. But guys, I want you to hear this, especially when our children and our teens to hear this. Humility is not putting yourself down. Humility is not pushing yourself away. Humility is a shift in focus from ourselves to God and others. A person with godly humility will have major positive self-worth because they know how much they are loved. They know that the perfect God of all creation loved them so much that he gave his one and only son for him. While they were still in a sinful state. And he now continues to use them for the purpose of fulfilling his kingdom. When we realize who we are in Jesus Christ, we're not put down as a nobody. We are co-heirs with Jesus. We are a brother of Jesus Christ. That's something to be joyful about. And John said in verse 29, his joy was fulfilled. He wasn't about gaining a, a following or building his kingdom. He was about building God's kingdom. When we truly know our role, our, pro, our joy is complete when it's fulfilled. But we are often unfulfilled, even in service to God, when we take or want to take credit for that which isn't ours to have. Listen, when you are humble 
You don't have to take the credit for what God is the author of. You are content and even joyful to be the pen and paper that he uses. It changes everything. And if we're going to be used of God, we are going to have to embrace humility in our life. I like what other great leaders have said about humility of service Jesus and service to Jesus. The humble man feels no jealousy or envy. He can praise God when others are preferred and blessed before him. He can bear to hear others praise while he was forgotten because he has received the spirit of Jesus who pleased not himself, who sought not his own honor. Therefore, in putting on the Lord Jesus Christ, he has put on the heart of compassion, kindness, meekness, long-suffering, and humility. That was Andrew Murray. M.R. DeHaan says, humility is something we should constantly pray for, listen to this part, yet never thank God that we have. You know, we say, God, thank you for making me so humble. You've lost it, okay? You've lost it right there, folks. Rick Warren says, pride builds walls between people. Humility brings, excuse me, humility builds bridges. Pride builds walls, humility builds bridges. But my favorite, maybe from old D.L. Moody, be humble or stumble. Simple, easy to remember. When Jesus has first place in our life, we know our role. John illustrated his role. You know, he had taught, he used the illustration of the best man and the, ba- and the bridegroom. Back in his culture, the best man was in charge of more than um, throwing an ungodly party and doing a toast, okay? The best man was to kind of keep watch over things, especially to keep watch and guard over the bride until the time when the groom, they finished up everything and they could go off and he could take his his bride away. And so the the best man was kind of like in charge of being on the watch. And it says that in in that culture, he would listen for the bridegroom to say, here I am. And then he could walk away and enjoy saying like, my job is done. They're now a married couple and he could move on. That was his job. And John is saying here that, that his job was to prepare the place to watch out for, to look for when Jesus came and to let the world, help the world be ready for it. And that when he came, his joy was fulfilled. In the same way, our job is to take care of the bride of Jesus who is who is who who's the bride of Jesus the church we're to take care of that bride and then as we've done that to have the joy the day when that trumpet sounds when the voice of God comes out and says I'm here for you I'm here for you church and then we can have that joy saying yes we're together with God for eternity when we know that's our role our joy can be complete. That happens when we do what we've invited you to do this week, to fade away. Verse 30, I think is one of the most defining verses for a follower of Christ in all the Bible. It shows us clearly that to follow Jesus, we need to decrease. Our focus needs to be off off of us and given to Jesus. Let me read it to you again. I must become greater he must become less. Or another translation, he must increase, I must decrease. Now, I may have said this to, in here, and I've said it to my students more than once. And hopefully, y'all remember this. I say, if you have a digital clock, you know, like in your car or on your phone, whenever you look at it and you see 1010, I've often encouraged my students to think of John 1010. The promise there, I've come that you might have life and have it most abundantly. And there are times when that's really been helpful. Like I remember being stuck on I-85 park, on the I-85 parking lot one time and thinking about how awful it was. And all of a sudden, 1010 came up and I thought, I'm sitting here in an air-conditioned vehicle listening to good music on the radio. And I'm worried about the fact that I'm stuck in traffic when so many other things could be rough. God, you've given me an abundant life. Well, I'd like to add another one in there. When you see 330 on your clock. Think of John 3.30. He must become greater. I must become less. Have that little reminder daily. You know, ask yourself, am I fading back and making Jesus a star? Or am I more concerned with my concerns than the concerns of others? I believe if we did this more, life would be amazing. Let me give you an illustration of how that could look. Um, There's a trick in cinematography 
where you put the main character in focus. You know, if you're, if you're watching a movie, sometimes you might, you might notice that in a picture when it's coming in for just a, a brief moment or whatever, someone in the background might be in focus. If you ever see that, it's a good idea to think, okay, they may be the bad guy. They may, because it's, it's kind of identifying who the star is. In fact, there's a, an iPhone commercial out right now where a character says, hey, do, am I okay? I, I, I feel kind of blurry. And the other character says, well, that's because you're not the main character. I'm the main character. You're blurry because you're not the main one. And then he goes, well, what if I became the main character? And suddenly, the guy that was the main character gets blurry, kind of hangs his head, and the other guy's in clear focus. Now, we tried to use that. Debbie worked so hard to try to see if Apple would let us use it, and they said no. But, um, but you know, that's okay. Um, but the thing is, I want, when you see that, I want you to use that as maybe a reminder. Who's the main character in your life? Who's the one in focus? It's an illustration of how our lives should be in Christ, in my opinion. A life lived in humility means that we should be fading away so he can be seen as the main character. He can be the main character in our life because Jesus Christ has earned that spot in our lives. Fading away puts the whole world in proper focus. Jesus is not just a prophet, a good man, or inspirational character. He is the son of God who came down from heaven to forgive our sins and to give us a relationship with God almighty, which also results in eternal life. You know, I love John's testimonies about Jesus. First testimony we have about Jesus from John that's recorded. He's at at Jesus' baptism and he says, look, behold, the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. He identifies exactly who Jesus is. And then his last recorded testimony we have here in John, it's a reminder that God has placed everything in Jesus' hands. The only way to have eternal life and to have God's wrath removed is to have that relationship with Jesus Christ. And that is why Jesus and Jesus alone is worthy of our attention and worthy of our focus. Remember, we're all sinners. No matter how good we may think we are, we are all guilty of rebellion against God. And and we all have sin and our sins cannot be tolerated by a holy God. And we can never make ourselves good enough for him. But you know what? I thank God that I don't have to. Jesus has taken care of all of that for us. We just have to believe. This changes how we should live everything. One thing we need to remember is there's no task too small or insignificant if it is what God has assigned. There is no task too small or insignificant if it's what God has assigned. If people would stop, and I have to look in the mirror and say this as well to me, stop trying to make themselves the main focus, much of the stress in life would be gone. It would keep many people from having hurt and resentment if they'd realize that doing and being what and who God intends for them will make life greater than they ever imagined. To do a task seen as secondary for God is actually a great task. Anything done in the service of God becomes something great. We can't justify ourselves. That only comes from God. And when we realize that and accept that and start living in his power, our lives become so, so much more powerful. And we can faithfully take care of what he has given us to take care of. John's example was all about Jesus. And that's what ours should be. When we decrease so that Jesus is increased, we begin to think in a heavenly manner. And this is reflected in how we live. Not just with our words, but with our actions. And as I said last week, when we realize that Jesus is the source of life, we will make our lives about sharing Jesus with others. Ministry opportunities that we have, and I I don't want to say ministry needs, but there's some that are need. They don't get filled out of guilt that, oh, man, Brian keeps saying we need preschool workers. All right, fine, I'll do it, God. I'm sure God's saying, oh, I'm so glad that's what I'm, no, no. When we realize that, that Jesus is greater and I'm less, when we hear of opportunities, we look, 
hey, God, are you calling me to do that one? Are you calling me to do that one? God, what are you, what, what are you putting in front of me to do? How are you, who are you giving me to serve? God, I, I want to do it the way you want me to do it. God, what are you telling me? What are we telling me? We won't mind getting dirty in the service to the least of those in our community. We will start to love those who are hard to love. There was an evangelist um, who was part of the, the, or a leader really of the, of the Salvation Army movement way back in the day named Evangeline Booth. And she would go around and often speak at, at halls that were crowded with tons of people. And she usually was in the poorest, the most despicable neighborhoods of the towns if in Paris or in London and other places, speaking to people considered the lowest, low-life scum of society. I'm not giving that, that brand. I'm talking about what the community brands were given. They would often scream at her, mock her, jeer, just try to break her heart. And one night as she was speaking, she looked back and saw a fallen girl back in the back, young lady, and she got down, walked back to that girl, put her arms around that girl, Gave her a kiss on the cheek and said, oh, my dear, I would to God that I could love you to Jesus Christ. It said that purer lips had never touched her cheek. The girl began to cry. Soon after, she came to the altar and gave her life to Christ and became a leader in ministry. Evangeline did love that girl to Christ. We are called to love people to Jesus. We can't forget that the main message of John chapter 3 is the incredible love that God has for all people. Jesus loves us out of our sin, out of our fallen state, and into eternal life. You, we are of incredible worth to God. He gave his best for us, you included. God loves you. You are loved with an everlasting love. Don't discount that. When we allow ourselves to fade away and bring Jesus into the focus, it changes everything. Our value isn't tied in how we look, our talents, or what we have, who our friends are. Our value is in the fact that God loved us so much he gave. Our values in the fact that he uniquely created us, uniquely gifted us, uniquely called us, uniquely placed us to share the love of Christ with those who need it the most. That is good news that we all need to hear and we all need to leave, live. But you know, John ends his testimony about Jesus, making it pretty clear that we have a choice to make. In Joshua 24, 15, Joshua put this command to God's people. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourself this day whom you will serve. Folks, we need to choose today who we're going to serve. He said, you can go serve the false gods that your fathers did. You can serve the gods of this land and this age. And let's face it, people, we got a lot of people that are serving the gods of this land, the gods of materialism, the gods of popularity, the gods of whatever feels good, do it, the gods of, well, my God, my, my faith system will be what I feel is right. But Joshua concluded that statement with, but as far as me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. And that starts by accepting Jesus. You know, I say it each time I preach because it's the most important thing we do. You have to start with the relationship with Jesus Christ of giving your life to him. When we accept Jesus, we have, not will have, we have eternal life. When you believe, you're saved right, in there, right then and there. And if you don't, you're lost right then and there. I don't know about you all, but I remember a prayer that, that I was taught as a child at night. And again, don't get mad at me. I just want you to think about this a little bit. But as a child, I even remember a prayer. As I lay me down to sleep, I pray the Lord my soul to keep if I should die before I wake. Anybody else would say that part of the prayer and think I'm staying awake all night tonight? <laughs> you know, um, I, I, I was there. But you know the joyous thing? It tells us that. That when we believe, we are saved, period. 
I don't have to worry about it. I'll say, Lord, will you take my soul if I die tonight? I can say, because of the blood of Jesus, my soul is with God now for all eternity. And I don't have to worry about it. But until you do, you've chosen to reject him. Because you see, indecision is a decision. And it's often a fatal one. And you know, I talked about John chapter 3 being, being a chapter with love. And then you may wonder, it's all about love. Why is the wrath of God and the fact that we're under it, what ends this chapter? Well, I think it's important to look at this. And I had a really good example of a very personal, very, very hard to handle personal example of it this week. Early part of the week, I helped chaperone an overnight trip for fifth graders down um, to the coast for some science experiments and stuff like that. And there was this one young man whose nasty commentary, I mean nasty commentary and, and demeanor was, was, was really troubling. And after a while, I was feeling myself getting a little hot under the collar. Ever been, been around somebody for a while and you feel yourself kind of just boiling a little bit? You know, and the thing is though, my, I'll call it wrath. My wrath wasn't directed at this kid. It wasn't at this kid. I'm, just, I'm not going to give you his name, but I'm just going to give you the, the letter B. Pray for B, okay? My wrath, if you want to use that word, was at the fact that no one was discipling this young man. That this young man was stuck in the natural state that people are without God. Uh, my wrath was directed at the sin and the system in this world. And I was bothered because this kid was in a natural state and not in a godly state. And I'm going to ask you, who will lead him? Who will help lead him to a relationship with Jesus Christ? You know, the ones that have the most opportunity to lead him are our children. Are we raising up godly boys and girls in this group who become godly young men and women, who become godly adults and godly parents who disciple their children to share the love of God with those who need it the most, to love them to Jesus Christ? The second question goes along with that for those of us, or that is the question for those of us who claim Jesus. Does how we think, how we treat each other, how we speak, how we spend our time, talents, and money, how we give of ourselves point to Jesus or us? Do we teach our children intentionally and unintentionally that Jesus is the main focus of our lives or that we are, that they are? Do you want to be a better parent, spouse, sibling, child just human make Jesus the focus of your life and you will be as he transforms everything finally I've got to ask are you giving Jesus your best because you see when we begin to fade away when we fade away he becomes a top priority now you're here and I'm not, I'm not harping on anyone who's here. And for those of you listening at home, watching at home, I'll be sharing a message with you. I'm not attacking anyone. This is being said in love. But folks, I think there's some people that are holding back on their involvement, holding back on what they're going to do, holding back on jumping in until things get normal again. People, pardon my English here, it ain't going to get normal again. But you know what? That's Okay. God is doing a new thing. God is still in control. The Holy Spirit is here still empowering people. Are you ready to be used of him to do that? You don't have to wait till we have a senior pastor named. God doesn't call us to serve a senior pastor. God calls us to serve him. Maybe your feelings have been hurt by something in the past or someone at the church. It's time to deal with it and move on. If there's a conflict that's still going on, meet with them and work it out. Work it out. If it's because of a past situation, today's a new day. Live like it. When we become less so that Jesus can become greater, such things don't handicap us in the service to our Savior. And again, this is a fully in love for those of you that are watching at home, watching online. I've heard people tell, them, tell me, you know, Brian, I'm having a tough time coming back because I love doing church in my pajamas and sipping my coffee. And some r r rationalize it by saying, at least I'm, I'm watching. 
Folks, do we really want to give Jesus the least in responding to him? Give him the least after he gave his best for us? We are told in Scripture not to neglect meeting together. We are to serve together. Now, if you have genuine health concerns and it prevents you from attending the meet, uh, a meeting here to being with people, if you're away from home, if you're unable to attend, that's why we do the broadcast. We want you to be a part of that. However, it should never be just for convenience sake. Part of fading away is allowing oneself to be accountable to others in a church family as God is working through us. And that doesn't happen in isolation. It comes from more than watching a service online or folks even just coming and enduring a worship service and leaving and getting back to your normally scheduled life. Because that's not what God called us to do. Now's the time for us to be used of God to build his church as he is called. As the video in Russ's commentary so clearly pointed out, when we realize just who God is and his greatness, it's pretty easy to start becoming less as he becomes more because we realize just who he is. Pray with me, please. Father God, I thank you for John and his testimony. But more than that, Lord, I thank you for the fact that you came and lived and died to give me eternal life. Lord, that you uniquely created and gifted me to be used of you. And Lord, you did that for each and every person on this planet who's ever lived. But we've got to accept that. Lord, I just pray that we would this day decide that we're going to choose you. If we've never asked you into our life to be our Lord and Savior, that we would do it today so that we could have your eternal life in us, so we could have your salvation, your Holy Spirit in us today. But Lord, maybe we've done it before, but we've allowed ourselves to be the one in focus instead of you. Lord, many have prayed for revival to happen in the church. Lord, it will happen when we fade away and let you take first focus. Lord, let us do that today so that our joy may be made complete as we know our role and your bride is become fit for you. Lord, I just pray that we would love people to you and that first starts by loving you with all that we are. Lord, give us the strength to do that now. Lord, help us to respond during this time as we sing. Lord, I pray that if you've called us to come and pray at the altar for our church, that we'd do it. If you've called us to pray and give our life to you, that we would do it. Lord, that we would do as you have called and live it accordingly. In your name I pray, amen. As we stand and sing, respond as God's called you. We 
So much as we worship together and I just pray that you will pray along with me that we will become less as he becomes greater. Opportunities to serve lie in these doors and definitely outside of these doors. And we're here for you throughout the week if you need us. Let's pray. Father God, thank you so much for allowing us to turn our eyes to you in the view that we have. Lord, thank you for providing for our every need. Lord, I just pray that you would just put a hedge of protection around us as individuals and around this church, that the, the poison of jealousy and pride will not be able to infect our veins, but Lord, instead, the humility of realizing the greatness of you and the joy that you give. Lord, let that rule supreme so that we may become the people in the church you have uniquely designed us to be. Thank you for all that you've given. Thank you for all that you will do as we respond faithfully to you. For it's in your name we do pray and praise. Amen. Peace. Mm -hmm. 